The 2021 IEEE Vision, Innovation and Challenges Summit and Honor Ceremony offers keynotes delivered by world-class thought leaders and technologists. And the highlight of the three-day virtual event is a recognition of global visionaries whose work has and continues to benefit humanity on a grand scale. Visit the awards website at corporate-awards.ieee.org. We'll include that URL in the show notes for more information. In the meantime, I'd like to tell you about the inaugural presentation of the IEEE Mildred Dressel House Medal. This award is presented for outstanding technical contributions in science and engineering of great impact to IEEE fields of interest. Google is the sponsor of this year's IEEE Mildred Dressel House Medal, and here to tell us a little bit more about the recipient is Dr. Vint Cerf. My name is Vint Cerf. I'm Google's Vice President and Chief Internet Evangelist. It's a big honor for us to sponsor the Mildred Dressel House Award and to see that it is given in its inaugural uh, event to Christina Johnson, who is a woman of many firsts and now the first recipient of this new IEEE Award. Uh, just reading through uh, Christina's biography is uh, mind-boggling and also exhausting. Nonetheless, uh, Christina, you represent the best of all possible role models for so many women in technical fields. So congratulations to you. Keep doing what you're doing. It benefits so many people, including our country and all of those who depend on the work that you've been doing. Thank you so much for joining us, Dr. Vince Cerf, and thank you to Google for your generous sponsorship of the IEEE Mildred Dressel House Medal. Without further ado, I'd like to welcome our award recipient. Dr. Christina Johnson is the 16th president of The Ohio State University. An engineer, inventor, and entrepreneur, Dr. Johnson has more than 30 years of experience and leadership in the academic, business, and public policy sectors. She also founded and led several successful science and technology companies, served as the Undersecretary of Energy at the U.S. Department of Energy, and held numerous leadership and academic roles at universities across the nation. Dr. Johnson holds more than 100 U.S. and international patents, and her pioneering work in micro displays and color polarizing technology earned her recognition from the National Inventors Hall of Fame, as well as the John Fritz Medal. Dr. Johnson earned her BS, MS, and PhD in electrical engineering at Stanford University. Thank you so much for joining us, President Johnson. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you very much for taking the time. So I am very grateful. I want to first give a shout out to the students in the IEEE undergraduate chapter at The Ohio State University for providing us with these questions to ask you. The first one they wanted me to present before you is that much of your research background is in optoelectronics. What are some of your proudest contributions to this field? And how do you see people building off your past work? I think some of the things I'm, I'm most proud of really have to do with pioneering the liquor crystal and silicon uh, displays, which then were integrated into rear projection television in the 2000s. And it implemented our color quad, which was an invention that a spinoff company from our research lab uh, created. And so I think it's the color quad, the liquid crystal and silicon devices um, in terms of the components. I think the thing I'm most proud of is the 20 PhD students and uh, half a dozen masters and bachelor students that I got a chance to work with that are just phenomenal people. That's beautiful. What are your thoughts on the current available technologies aimed at cutting back on carbon emissions, such as renewable energy generation, electrification of vehicles, building energy efficiency, and so on? And where do you see the future of these technologies? So I'm very passionate about cutting our carbon footprint. And when I was Undersecretary of Energy at the Department of Energy, we created the Strategic Technology Energy Plan which was a pathway in 2010 to get to 83% reduction in greenhouse gas emissions from the 2005 baseline by 2050. Now we know we have to get there faster. And there are really five levers that we talked about. One is energy efficiency. We need to each year cut about 3% from our energy use. 
The second one is to electrify the um, light duty vehicles or transportation and it's decarbonize our electricity so that when we power the electric vehicles, it's clean energy that's powering them. We, we need to upgrade our, our grid, of course, and we need to do fuel switching. So uh, air transportation, other transportation, we need to go to biofuels. Those are the sort of five levers, if you will, that we came up with that we need to invest in and really research. And that's, um, I'd say the biggest one is going to be decarbonizing our electric sector and uh, electrifying our light duty vehicles. How does your background in electrical engineering contribute to your ability to perform in your current position as president of the Ohio State University? I think engineering is a great background in leadership because you take really big problems and you learn how to break them down into little pieces and then put them back together again so that the whole functions better or at least as well as the individual parts and that the individual parts are better for being part of the system. That's very similar to a university. You wanna make sure that the whole of the university functions really well and much better than the individual parts. At the same time, you want the individual parts to succeed because they're part of a great institution. Uh, you started your position as the president of the Ohio State University shortly after the COVID-19 pandemic began. Wow. How do you manage being thrown into such a challenging situation unexpectedly? So, and I think all leaders of higher education today, actually all companies and corporations, we're dealing with multiple pandemics. We're dealing with the pandemic of uh, COVID-19. We're dealing with the pandemic of systemic racism. We're dealing with the pandemic of the, the economy and responding to both of those pandemics and others. So I think the first is uh, you can only do what you can do that day. You can plan for the future. You need to definitely take time in order to plan, but whatever you can do that day, you have to do. And so when I first came to the Ohio State University, I, we were starting to see an uptick in the COVID infection rate, hospitalizations and uh, intubations from people that were hospitalized. And the reason why is because we think that it really came from some of the gatherings around July 4th and they're just starting to peak in time for all our students to come back. So we recognize that we needed to increase our testing by an order of magnitude, increase our tracing by an order, order and magnitude. And to be able to house our students that tested positive or were exposed to people who were positive. And that, uh, so we rented two hotels off campus in order to do the isolation and quarantine. We stood up in a week, the ability to test every single one of our students once a week. And that really was the res resulted in why in good measure, we, we stayed open the entire year, which was a huge success. So very proud of our community for rising to the occasion. That's very impressive that you looked at for your students that way. How have you balanced your interest in developing both technical and leadership skills throughout your career path? So thinking about balancing leadership and technical skills, uh, I like people. I like being around people. I like um, uh, taking an interest in, in everyone's life. And it, that's what a leader does. So I think that once uh, I recognize that that's something that I really enjoyed, trying to serve others and to empower them to do great things, no, I realized that I needed to, to learn about how to do that. So a lot of it was self-reading and uh, becoming a student of leadership. And that's been very helpful. And then seeking out opportunities where I could put that learning to practice. I've had the, been very fortunate to have great mentors. People who took an interest in me. It's time for me to pass that on. Now, when you say seeking out opportunities to put that into practice, what did that look like for you? So I think that's when I was a assistant professor at the University of Colorado Boulder, we put together a team that ended up winning the largest grant the university had ever received at the time. And it was our first National Science Foundation Engineering Research Center. So the ability to bring people together and to work on ideas and create uh, order out of chaos, if you will, that was really fun. And then I had the opportunity to do that at the next level as dean of the Pratt School of Engineering at Duke University, which is a tremendous opportunity to to be both the chief academic officer of the School of Engineering, the chief budget officer, and the chief fundraiser, as well as the uh, strategic visionary working with outstanding faculty. And again, we came up with a strategic plan, 
I was mentored by a great provost and president. So it was really an ideal situation to learn how to be a leader. Amazing. Having worked in many different areas, including education, university research, the private sector, and the government, what were some of your most enjoyable aspects of the different positions you've held throughout your career path? You know, I think the, the most enjoyable is working with uh, faculty, students, and staff, which is why, um, although I, I've gone into industry and I liked making a difference there, I enjoyed government because I also could make a difference, particularly during uh, the Great Recession when we were reaching almost 10% unemployment and we really wanted to get you know, citizens back to work. So the American Recovery and Reinvestment Act was a, a really big deal and something we focused on a lot when I was undersecretary. At the end of the day, the true calling is to be back on a university campus where I can interact with students, with our faculty members, can think about how to make an institution better for you know, nearly 100,000 people. So that's pretty exciting. Would you be able to speak about your experiences as a woman in the mostly male dominant field of engineering? How do you think more opportunities can be created in engineering fields for underserved populations? So I think one of the things that I've thought about as a woman in engineering is there, there weren't a lot of men in engineering when I was uh, undergraduate or graduate student. And, uh, but I really had, was treated very well by the men that were in the, the field. And so that was very helpful. They were great mentors, my faculty members, the students were collaborative. Um, but it is tough sometimes, you can doubt yourself if you don't do so well, say on an exam and you're the only one, you think, well, you know, maybe maybe it's true what the, the uh, people say that, you know, they seem to be surprised that you're a woman in engineering. I think the most important thing then is, you know, you just have to stay committed and focused. And we as leaders need to get more women and underrepresented minorities and underrepresented groups into the field because the country needs it. It's, it's in a, and it's a wonderful career. I want everyone to have the opportunity to have the kind of career that I have had and enjoyed in engineering. And so that means opening it up to underrepresented minorities, women, and uh, all underrepresented groups. So at the end of every interview, I ask two questions. The first question is, how have you taken a challenging time and turned it into a potential future investment? We all have challenging times in our lives and how we utilize them can make all the difference in the world. I think the, you know, one of the ones that sticks out for me is when I was a first year graduate student, I was diagnosed with Hodgkin's disease, which is a cancer of the lymph system. Now this was back in 1979. And so the treatment was still somewhat nascent and involved really um, intense x-rays from a cobalt source that would eradicate the, Stern, uh, the Reed Sternberg cells that are indicative of, of Hodgkin's. So I went through surgery and about four months of radiation therapy. And at the end of the day, I learned a lot, obviously, about myself and about that it really is up to you. There's no one else that can, can uh, you know, see you through that. It's such a personal thing that you go through. My family is very supportive. My friends were great. But at the end of the day, you are the one that has to respond to the treatment or not. And having come out the other side, I recognize the importance of cross-disciplinary research. Because had it not been a radiologist, Henry S. Kaplan at Stanford, talking to an electrical engineer, Ed Ginston, and a physicist, um, Mitch Weisbluth, we would not have the linear accelerator, which was the ability to take the Stanford linear accelerator, which is, I think, a several mile loop that accelerates particles to then bombard a, a target, then give off these x-rays. They shrunk it into something that could sit, fit inside a medical laboratory. And I got to be the beneficiary of that. And since then, it just burned into my brain that cross-disciplinary research is what's so important to solve some of our world's greatest problems, like cancer. So that was, I mean, I probably could have learned it without having to gone through it, but it made a big impact. And that's guided my research over the last 40 years. That is absolutely amazing. Obviously, you've led a very full life. You have an amazing career. What is the best way for our viewership to continue to see what exciting steps you're taking next in your career path? Well, Jacqueline, thank you very much. Um, my uh, Twitter handle is 
Prez K M Johnson, all one word, of course. And then Instagram is Prez K M Johnson as well. Dr. Johnson, I appreciate you taking time out of your morning to join us for this episode. Thank you so much for this conversation. Thank you. It was a pleasure. Appreciate it. Thanks for joining us. If you enjoyed this episode, please click like below and also subscribe to see future episodes.